Welcome back. I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. This is part two of a video about the medications we commonly use in the intensive care unit. If you have not seen part one yet, I'll link it up above and I'll place a link in the description below. The next medication we'll talk about is anticoagulation. So this is a class of medications that thin the blood. So anticoagulation are also blood thinners. We'll use these in the setting of somebody having a clot somewhere, whether it is in their legs, a DVT, in their lungs, a pulmonary embolism. Sometimes we'll use blood thinners if somebody's had a heart attack or concern for a heart attack because many times that's due to clots in the blood vessels that supply the heart or if they have a concern for stroke blood thinners are used quite frequently in the intensive care unit especially in the setting of blood clots or a very high suspicion of blood clots because if we are concerned somebody has a blood clot that is causing a life-threatening condition we will start the blood thinners up front while we're waiting for diagnostic testing to come back. Heparin is the most commonly used anticoagulation in the ICU. And again, this is a medication that we can use as an IV drip. And we monitor the levels and the thinness of the blood to determine the dose for each patient. There is an, also a medication called TPA or Altaplace, and this is a clot busting agent. So this is a very concentrated blood thinner clot buster that we will give in the situation of most commonly a stroke. If somebody has stroke-like symptoms, we're concerned that they have a blockage or clot in their brain, we'll go ahead and give this. The first thing we do though, is to make sure that they don't have any contraindications to receiving this medication. So we'll do a CAT scan of the head because if they have bleeding in their head, we absolutely do not want to give this medication. We also ask them if they've had any recent bleeding in the past that's been life-threatening or prior brain hemorrhage or any major surgeries. So there are some situations where we cannot use this medication but it is most commonly used for an acute stroke. The other common reason to use this, and it's definitely seen much less frequently than a stroke, is if somebody has a very large pulmonary embolism that is life-threatening. There are other blood thinners and other techniques used to treat pulmonary embolisms, but if it looks like it's turning into a life-threatening condition, we will give Alta place to try to bust that clot up. And like I said, there are a lot of risks to giving this medicine. We have to make sure that there aren't any big contraindications and that's why we don't give it to every single person who has blood clots in their lungs because sometimes the risks outweigh the benefits of giving this medicine. So just like I said in the first video for most of the medications I talked about there, everything has an opposite. So if somebody is having bleeding, then we do have reversal agents for some of the blood thinners. Warfarin, also called Coumadin, is a medication that's very commonly used outside of the hospital for blood thinning. There are newer medicines in more recent years that are starting to be used more frequently than warfarin, but warfarin is still a very common medication used for blood thinning outside the hospital. So if somebody is on warfarin and they come in with bleeding, life-threatening bleeding, we need to reverse that as soon as we can. So we know that warfarin particularly works on vitamin K, so we will give the patient vitamin K. We also have a medication called K-Centra, which is a bunch of clotting factors. This medication is also used for reversal of warfarin or other anticoagulation agents. And of course, we also give plasma or what we call FFP, to try to reverse the blood thinner. It's a medicine called protamine that will reverse the effects of heparin. And then, like I said, there are some newer oral agents for blood thinning. We call them DOAX or direct oral anticoagulants. And these medications can be reversed by either Kcentra or another medication called Indexa. I know I said in a prior video that IV fluids are probably the most commonly used 
medication or substance in the intensive care unit, but something else that we use very frequently are antibiotics. There are many types of antibiotics. There are many classes of antibiotics. So I will not go into the nitty gritty of antibiotics because I am certainly not an antibiotics expert. In general, we will give patients, if we have a high suspicion of infection, we will give them what we call broad spectrum antibiotics. And this just means that these antibiotics cover many different types of bacteria. And we usually base it on the patient, how old they are, what they're at risk for, if there's any sign pointing us to a particular type of infection, such as pneumonia or urinary tract infection, we select our broad spectrum antibiotics based on the most likely bacteria or types of bacteria to infect this patient. And as we get their culture results back from blood, sputum, urine, then we're able to tease out exactly what bacteria the patient's growing and which antibiotics are best for that particular bug. So someone might start off on a regimen such as vancomycin and cefepime, which are two medications that cover many different types of bacteria. And as we figure out what type of bacteria they have growing, then we narrow that down to be very specific to, to that bug. The reason why we don't leave everyone on broad spectrum antibiotics because it sounds great, right? It covers everything. Well, that also breeds a lot of resistance. And we don't want to give people inappropriate antibiotics when they're either not actively infected or if it's covering too many different things. So antibiotics are for bacterial infections. For viral infections, I've talked about different types of viral infections in my other videos, but it is what we call supportive care. There are very few antivirals that we'll use. We were using remdesivir during the pandemic. In general, we don't give everybody an antiviral unless we have a high suspicion for an infection. So an example is if somebody who is a young adult, 20s, 30s, 40s, comes in with concern for meningitis or encephalitis, and we're waiting for their lab results to come back, a very common cause of encephalitis in young people is herpes. So we will give them a antiviral called a cyclovir that covers herpes to cover them until we get the results back, just because we don't wanna be waiting while the person is having this life-threatening infection. So that is an antiviral we may use, but in general, I don't, give antivirals frequently. Another medication that is available to us, but we don't use very frequently are antifungals. I'd say I use antifungals much more than antivirals. And this is if somebody has a fungal infection. So they can have fungemia, that means fungus in the blood. This is much more common in somebody who may be immunocompromised than somebody who's coming in from the community with a normal immune system. And one of the more common antifungals we use is called mycofungin. Most common fungus that I've seen in the intensive care unit and the hospital in general is a, is a fungus called candida. But in terms of antifungals and antivirals, it would have to be the right patient coming in with a high suspicion for a viral or fungal infection for us to automatically start these medications, where if somebody looks like they're actively infected, we suspect it's typically due from to a bacteria, which is why we start off with antibiotics. Our final groups of medications is a little bit of a hodgepodge. So one medication that we'll use frequently is insulin. Many people, in the community are diabetic, but sometimes people can have higher blood sugars that need to be controlled when they're admitted to the hospital. And this can be for several different reasons, but there are some times when we use higher dose steroids in the ICU. So that can drive the blood sugar up. So we'll use insulin to control the blood sugar. Someone may come in with a condition called DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis or another condition affecting the blood sugar called hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. Many times people come in with very, very elevated blood sugar. Sometimes it's so high it can't be detected by the finger stick. A lot of times people come to the emergency room saying they check their sugar at home and they were not able to even pick up a reading on their finger stick, it was so high. I've seen blood glucose levels in the thousands. And if you don't know, the, the normal range for, for glucose is usually 80 to 120 for fasting. 
And just for a reference, anything above 126 is typically considered diabetic. So in the thousands, it's extraordinarily high. These patients will come to the intensive care unit and get placed on insulin drip and have their glucose monitored every single hour until their glucose is under better control. Another patient population that we closely monitor the blood sugar in are cardiac surgery patients. And this is because there have been studies that show that morbidity and mortality are improved when a cardiac surgery patient's glucose is under tight control postoperatively. Many times if these patients aren't diabetic, they may still come out of the OR on an insulin drip just to very tightly control their blood sugar in the first 24 hours postoperatively. I already talked about anticoagulation, but we do use what we call DVT prophylaxis, and these are medications to prevent the formation of a blood clot, DVT, particularly in the legs because people who are sedentary are at higher risk of having blood clots. So people who are in the hospital are at high risk because they're not moving around as much, especially in the ICU. If you're on a breathing machine and sedated, you're not moving around very much at all. So we give them medications, typically heparin, and this is not the drip form. This is just subcutaneous. That means that we just inject it under the skin or another medication called Lovenox or Anoxaparin. So those are the two most common DVT prophylaxis used. We also use the sequential compression devices, SCDs, that squeeze the bottom um, part of the leg, the lower leg, to promote blood flow to keep the blood moving and prevent clots. And finally, we also use something called GI prophylaxis, and this is to prevent stress ulcers. So patients who are on mechanical ventilation, patients who are on high dose steroids, patients who aren't eating as much as they had been or who might be NPO are at high risk of forming stress ulcers in their stomach. So we give them medications to decrease the acid production in their stomach so they don't get stress ulcers. So the most common are proton pump inhibitors or PPIs and pentoprazole is a very common one or H2 blockers, these are histamine 2 blockers, which also affect the acidity in the stomach. And the most common one we use from that is called famotidine. So this concludes part two of the medications we use in the intensive care unit. I hope you enjoyed this video. If there are any medications that you really want to hear about that I didn't talk about, let me know below, but I feel like we covered most of them. I can think of a couple I could have added, but honestly, these are the highlights. These are the most frequently used ones. If you enjoy this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel if you want to see more, and you can follow me over on Instagram at the Intense MD for more medical information, education, and just seeing what's going on in my everyday life. Keep an eye out for my next video. It should be up in the next week or so. See you next time.